Christmas day. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Amen. we just thank you that we can be here and we're just so grateful for who you are and what you're doing in each of us in your name amen let's continue standing as the kids head off to their kids church and uh have a time of greeting one another
What a joy to see all of you here this morning. What a great, great group. Wow, 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 wow. And uh, here's the special thing we want to do before we jump into the uh, sermon this morning. Uh, it's great to have Mike and Coach there. I want to invite up uh, Tom and Becky Williams. About a month or so ago, we introduced this wonderful couple to you. And it was either last Sunday or the Sunday before they came to us at church and said, Pastor, we want to join the church. And I said, we want you to join the church, yeah. And uh, we do have a certificate. My wife didn't know we were doing this, like, impromptu. <laughs> so, but uh, I know she didn't specifically ask. So, but I just want to say something. Um, and, and I just, over the years, uh, the Lord has blessed me with bringing other clergy into the life of the church. Uh, I said this in Sunday school. I'll say it again. We can't, pastors can't go it alone. And uh, you have God bring someone along uh, over the years, a guy named Jay Smith in our last church. We got here Brother Wilson, and then also uh, others. Uh, Brother Hunt was here for a while. And uh, and even though I have a, an excellent, uh, best to be found anywhere associate in Pastor Dan, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll raise the roof on that one. So, uh I have a bucket list of things that will cause me to end my life. Uh, one of them is if I lose my sense of taste. I, I can't smell, but if I ever lose my sense of taste, it's over. Uh, Pastor Dan never leaves. It's over. But uh, in the meantime, I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. But, but God has seen fit to bring us a wonderful couple, another pastor, and uh, uh, Pastor Tom and his wife, Becky. And we are just blessed to have them now come into our fellowship because pastors, there, there's a call, there's a passion, there's a code. I can't fill the blanks with all those words. Uh, kindred spirit. And, and I sense that. We met a couple weeks ago. He came into the office and we spent an hour and just chatted together, prayed together. Thank you for being part of our family now. And we want to officially bring you into membership. And uh, uh, I'd like to pray and then we'll uh, just welcome you in. So I have to let you know something, though, before we do this, okay? Uh, this is not a perfect church, okay? We're not perfect people. There will be some time that we will let you down, okay? Yeah. Uh, there will be some time that I let you down. I'm totally uh, fallible, okay? And yeah. so so I just share that with you right up front so there are no misconceptions as we pray and, and bring you into membership. Yeah, except Sally. It's great to have Sally back today. Uh, we do have a person among our midst that is perfect. So you yeah. you will, so it just one, so... <laughs> But, uh, but I share that with you because sometimes people look at a church and when the pastor does something stupid and wrong, they're like, oh, I hate that pastor, I hate that church. Well, God's the perfect one. Yeah. We understand that. Uh, Jesus came, dwelt among us, and we're going to talk about that in the sermon in just a minute. So he's our model. He's what we strive to be like day by day. So let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing Tom and Becky Williams into our fellowship. There's no formal class they need to take because they understand the ins, outs, ups, and downs of ministry. They have stood where we stand. They have brought the word faithfully. And Father, now in this phase of life, you've brought them to bring us joy and encouragement. We heard it in Tom's heart as he led class this morning. In the absence of our teacher, he led class. And Jesus, we're blessed. We thank you for the passion they have to see your kingdom come, your will be done among people whether it be here at Harris Chapel or where Becky works or where they do life with family, kids and grandkids. I pray your richest blessing on them. We welcome them in with open arms. And we just pray that you will help us to have many years of fruitful, joyful ministry that will bring glory and honor to you, that will bless them as they serve, and that, Father, will expand your love and grace among each one in this sanctuary those watching on Facebook Live, and all those who will be coming in in the days and years ahead. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome them to membership this morning. So. Congratulations. Thank you. I know you spoke a few weeks. Anything you want to share today? Have you said a few words then? I, anything you want to say, brother? Or Becky? No? Okay. All right. I, I put you on the spot right there. But anyway, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, this is great. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to 
camp out in Leviticus a little bit, in John chapter 1 a little bit, and over in Revelation. But it is so good to see all of you in the sanctuary today. I can't say that enough. I'm kind of feeling a little, um, I don't know if the word is melancholy today, because my friend um, who does our PowerPoint is spending his first day in heaven. His name is Fritz. And um, I'm just kind of having a hard time. I broke a little bit of go in Sunday school, and I may break again before the sermon's over. But I have been blessed richly over the years. As God brings people along who enhance a pastor's ministry, um, over the years, of course, we were blessed when we got here. There were guys like Jerry Cook and John Wedmore and Jim Justice and Art Hensley and Barney Johnson and Jack Downing and John Harris and others who are in heaven now. Uh, I mentioned Jim Justice, if I not, I should have. He's my right-hand guy. Um, and it breaks my heart when those gentlemen are translated on to heaven, but I have to keep reminding myself that's why we do what we do, because heaven is going to be our home. This is just a temporary place. And then God brings other men along, and uh, wow. And, and he seems to have it in such a way that it's kind of like a, the last, maybe the last chapter in their life. And Fritz was one of those guys. Uh, another one was, um, I made a list here. Another one was a guy named uh, Dave Lefkart, who's also experienced his first Sunday in heaven. And Don Lefkart, and Merv Barnard, and Rodney Johnson, and Bill McNutt and Tom O'Dell, and Don Wilder. Uh, it's, that's the hardest thing about being a pastor. You know, what we just did with Tom and Becky, that's the most exciting thing about being a pastor. That and baby dedications, you know, and baptism services. Those are like the top things. And wedding ceremonies, those are like the top things. But the list I just read to you, it's the hard stuff. Because these are people we journey with. Again, and you think of others like Frank and Melba, the list goes on. But again, they are rejoicing in heaven. And I've heard it said, and I'm learning to believe it more and more, that once they breathe their last year and their next breath is in heaven, they don't want to come back here. We want them here. We grieve their going. You know, another one, George Harris. I mean, the list goes on and on. I can, it's over 100 names. But I just tell you this because they impact our lives. And I'm thankful you're here. And uh, Tom and Becky, we're grateful you're here. You need to stay a long time, okay? <laughs> okay, because <laughs> no one else, please, no one else, okay? So I just say that publicly. I'm going to talk to you today, and I'm doing this because it, it follows up with Fritz. And if I can borrow Steve and Don for just a minute, I'm going to give you another chance. Gentlemen, if you'll take these and just share them and, uh, like, divide them up. And if you did not get these before, back in April, Fritz did an entire series of of material on the feasts and festivals of the Old Testament. And they're found in Leviticus. And I'm going to go on to that next slide, okay? Today we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. And then if we can go on to the next slide, it happens that a Bible that was given to me by Byron Hunt back in about, oh, the year 2000, maybe 2001, it was a wonderful pastor's Bible, um, one time after Ozzy was, and this isn't Ozzy, but this is another dog that's like saying at the bottom of the screen there, say what? Uh, uh, we, Ozzy was left home and I came home one day and he had eaten my Bible. Yeah, he had, he had, he had eaten my Bible. And I tried to piece it back together and I made it pretty good, except for this. He destroyed, and I'm sure he consumed, the book of Leviticus. So I thought about that as I was looking at Leviticus this week and talking about the festivals, and I can truly tell you the dog ate my homework as he digested the book of Leviticus. And we want to look at chapter 23 this morning as we get started, and we want to talk about and continue, and, and this is in honor of Fritz, but more than that, this is because we need to hear what I'm about to tell you. And I love at the beginning of this, notice these first few words in Leviticus 23. The Lord said to Moses. If you look in Leviticus 24, it starts out the same way. And other chapters have this statement, 
the Lord said to Moses. Isn't that neat? When we pick up the Bible, it's not like, well, this person, I and mean, I love to read people like Max Lucado and other wonderful writers as they're inspired to, to, to put together words dealing with the life of Jesus or the life of the Holy Spirit and, and the ministry and the life of the church and leadership. But, but it's interesting when you look at the Bible, it doesn't say, I felt inspired one day to write this. Or as I was out walking or jogging or looking at nature, God gave me this word. It says this clearly. And let's say those five words together. You ready? The Lord said to Moses, I think that's a big deal. Do you say that's a big deal? You know, you and I, we, I hope you don't believe everything you read in the newspaper. It's okay to believe a lot of it, but don't believe all of it. I hope that you don't believe everything you see on the news on TV. It's okay to catch the facts and move forward, avoid the spin. I hope you don't believe everything you see on social media. It's okay to, to find different things in social media and say, I like that, that helps me. It's, it's good food for thought. And, and I, I need to, to hear that when I heard it and somebody posted something that blessed my heart. But don't believe everything on social media. I promise you this morning though, you and I can believe everything that's in here. You understand that? We can believe everything that's in here. And so when he starts off, as Moses is, is penning these words, the Lord said to me, the Lord said to Moses, notice what he says, speak to the Israelites, say to them, these are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Let's go to the next slide. And that is the heart of what we want to look at today. One of these great feasts. When I was visiting with Fritz, Janie and I were down there on Tuesday, and his mind was just as clear as could be. And I was talking, I said, Fritz, this Sunday, I already planned to preach to them on the Feast of Tabernacles and use some of his material. And I was talking about it, he says, he says, you know what, Pastor, you forgot about the Feast of Trumpets. I said, we'll get to the Feast of Trumpets, you know. And then he walked me through this material in Leviticus, and he talked about material from Deuteronomy, and he took me to Daniel, and he didn't even have his Bible. It was next to him on, on, the, on the bed stand, but it wasn't with him. And he was quoting all these scriptures about these feasts. If you had any reading of Fritz's material over the last month or so, there was, there was starting to be, as his health was failing, and Janie said it so well in Sunday school, his mind was getting sharper and sharper. He was talking more and more about the great white throne judgment. He was talking more and more about the rapture. In fact, he had a book beside his bed called Rapture 911. It was about as thick as the hymnal that's in the rack in front of you. And I looked in the opening, and, I, and he was just kind of telling me about this book. And I looked in the front page, and it was an introduction. It says, if you're a believer and you are reading this, the rapture has not yet taken place. And you have an assignment to tell as many people as possible about Jesus. And then you open it up to the next. There's another introduction. <clears throat> if you're not a believer, the rapture has happened, and you found this book, and you need to read it to see what's going to happen moving forward. That was on Tuesday at men's breakfast on Wednesday. We got the call that Fritz had truly breathed his last early that morning and was no longer seeing through a glass darkly, but face to face with Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And it made me think in the midst of my grief that that's what Fritz was, 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 was looking forward to. That's what his life was about, especially these last few years. So why are we talking about this this morning? These appointed festivals. Well, let's look on further. This festival, if you look at the next slide, it says celebrate this as a festival of the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. And if we go on to the next slide, all native-born Israelites are to live in such shelters so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Let's leave it on this slide. Okay, I asked Fritz on Tuesday, I said, Fritz, if people ask me, why are you studying these festivals and feasts, what do I tell them? He said this, it points to Jesus. It was very interesting, a scripture he gave us in one of the studies earlier in Amos talks about anything you see in the New Testament, and it, basically what he was saying was anything that's fulfilled was prophesied in the Old and so that was in Amos. And so as we're looking at this, I want you to think about this. God wants us to look at these festivals and feasts. And we're not going to take time because this particular festival, it was eight days long. You had a day at the beginning, 
solemn assembly, worship service. And then on the eighth day, that was day one, on the eighth day, which was obviously a week later, another solemn assembly worship service. But during this week, all that week, they would bring all kinds of sacrifices. And every day, the, the, the priest would go down to the, uh, to, the, to the pool of Siloam and gather out some water, and that was symbolic of God being with them. And he says here, I want you to live in these temporary shelters because back when you were in bondage in Egypt and I took you out of that bondage, you were living in temporary housing. And this is that reminder. The reason we need to celebrate these feasts is we need to remember what God has done for us. And one word that keeps coming to my mind, and that's the next slide, is the word gratitude. That's the major focus of all the feasts, of all the festivals, is gratitude. I know we think about it a lot in the month of November and Thanksgiving, and we sit around the table, and what are you thankful for? Gratitude should be something in our DNA as followers of the Most High God, should be something in our DNA all year long. Do you understand gratitude and carnality cannot coexist? Do you understand that gratitude and selfishness cannot coexist? Gratitude and bitterness, and the list just goes on. Gratitude just trumps all of that. And Moses is telling them in the book of Leviticus, the reason you celebrate these festivals is God wants you to remember how he delivered you, how he provided for you. And oh, by the way, day one and day eight of this festival have this sacred assembly. Let's look at the next slide. The Israelites, they were commanded to make temporary dwellings and to live in them for the duration of the feast. They were called tabernacles or booths. And it talks about our temporary existence in bodies made of temporary dust and relates to Jesus emptying himself. Uh, Fritz talked about that. Tabernacle. Tabernacle with us in a body made of flesh, a temporary dwelling place. The tabernacle of Jesus in his physical form is the first prophecy in the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that interesting? That's what Fritz was trying to get me to understand. So what we do is we remember. We, we remember what God has done for us, and that's what gratitude is all about. Anything that I have, anything that you have, it's not that we're spoiled. It's we've been blessed, okay? Okay. We've been blessed. We've been blessed whether we were with our health, with our relationships, with the jobs we have. The gratitude, it's all about the blessing. And let's go on to a couple more slides. And then he wants to point us, Moses points us, as we look at this Feast of Tabernacles onto the New Testament, onto the New Testament of Jesus coming and tabernacling, if that's a word, Jesus coming and dwelling among us. So let's look at the slide, uh, the next one that talks about this. In fact, maybe two more slides. Let's go to another one. Oh, is that it? There it is. Yeah. To tabernacle with us in a body made of flesh. I read that to you just a second ago. That's this idea of Jesus coming and being with us. Now, let's look at the next one. And this is our scripture. And I want us to read it from John chapter 1. Because this chapter, we looked at it a couple of weeks ago where Jesus was calling his disciples. And, and, he, and, he, and he was like, who are you bringing? I guess we talked about it actually Wednesday night at prayer meeting online. Who are you bringing with you? When Jesus is walking along by the Sea of Galilee there. And, and all of a sudden, these guys are out there fishing. And one by one, he calls them. And they begin to follow him. And Andrew brings his brother Peter. And this idea in chapter 1 of John is Jesus is now in the flesh. Just like you and me pinch yourself in the flesh. This isn't a dream. And he's walking among us. Let's read that John 1, 14. You ready? We'll start with word and. Here we go. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's say that again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. One of the things you understand when you go to the Holy Land or you watch documentaries about Israel, Jesus literally walked those streets. Jesus literally was at this pool. He was at the Sea of Galilee. When you're being baptized in the Jordan, Jesus literally was baptized right here. He came and lived among those people. That's exciting. 
And so when we're there in Israel and looking around, it's like Jesus was there. Jesus was there. Jesus taught there. Jesus drove the money changers out there and all these different places. And we just understand that Jesus literally lived there. You know, we have kids that have gone to junior high camp, kids that have gone to senior high camp. Rookie camp's happening right now. This afternoon, the van takes off, and we're taking kids to preteen camp. And our prayer is that they will experience Jesus with them at camp. Amen? We want them to experience a relationship with Jesus. That's, that's the only reason we send them to camp, okay? If we wanted them just to go play around and goof off and stuff like that, we could just turn them loose in the woods. It wouldn't cost us any money, you know? We just say, here, each of you get a paintball gun and come back when you run out of little paintballs, you know? Last man standing wins. They just, just have fun. But there's a reason we send them to camp. It's because we want them to understand this particular thought, this concept that, that started back in the Feast of Tabernacles because Moses was telling the people, remember, remember, remember. Anything that's happened in your life, blessing and sometimes even not a blessing, God is calling us to remember, to remember. He is, the, he is the source of all the gifts of life. I don't even know if I spelled that word properly or not. Probably not spelled properly, but that's okay. The Greek word translated as dwelt, dwelt among us, literally means tabernacled. Or as Tony Evans said, he came and set up home in your neighborhood. He lives right in your neighborhood. I need Jesus in my neighborhood. Do you need Jesus in your neighborhood? I need him in my neighborhood. And that's what we find here in John chapter 1, that Jesus literally came in the flesh, tabernacle. If we fast forward to the end of the New Testament, the next slide says tabernacle. And this is what Fritz was trying to remind me of this fact. The only thing was he beat me to the finish line. The, the scripture is true of Fritz Dulock's life. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This guy finished his race. You know, he ran the race. He fought the fight. He kept the faith. And this thing that's a prophecy for us is a reality for him. And it says here that Jesus is coming again. That's what Fritz wanted us to know. It's just that he beat the system and he got to see Jesus before Jesus came to see us. Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. See, that's what I need in my life. I don't need, I don't need more money, and neither do you. Money is temporary. Money comes, money goes. I don't need more although I wouldn't turn down more concannon donuts. Concannon donuts come, concannon donuts go. Oh, to sit out on North Broadway at the brand new um, Porta on the little patio outside eating is always the best, and you're sitting on the patio and they bring you endless chips and salsa. I don't need any more of that. It's good, but I don't need it. You know what I need more than anything? I need this right here. I need this right here. I don't need more headaches and heartaches and all that that goes with life itself because there are times when there's a lot of those in life, as we saw in Ecclesiastes. There was one of those verses in Sunday school I wanted to just look at, but we didn't look at it because I was just following and trying to keep in touch with everything that was happening. It's like, it's like where the writer of Ecclesiastes in that verse 10 or so says, I... I, I, I see what God sees with the hardship of man, the struggles of man. I, I see what God has seen there. Whew. Sometimes God gives us little glimpses of the hardship of others. When it breaks our heart, we, we turn on the news, and most likely it's on your weather channel app where, where some kind of storm has devastated entire regions of the country, and it's like, oh, that's terrible. And it's like just for a minute, you, you maybe feel just a little bit of what God feels about heartache and loss, and and that's, that's tough, but, but this is what I need more than anything. This is why I need to be in the Word. And this is why, and I want to just kind of harp on this for a minute, this is why it's so important for you and me to gather together as the body of Jesus week after week to be reminded that Jesus wants to dwell among us, John chapter 1. He wants to literally dwell in our midst. And when we come together, and, and Case does a great job with that beautiful song I'd never heard before to open the service, I'm like, yes, it's about the blood, and it's just so amazing, and I needed to hear that. For just a minute, and it's so hard to do because you're like me, to turn off our brain about all the other stuff going on in our world, it's so hard. 
you know? It's so hard because we walk in and somebody says, did you see this in the news? Did you hear that? And all of a sudden our mind is off here, it's off there, and then we're just going 10 directions. If there would be some way that we could just walk through these doors and automatically are, Jesus, we're in the presence. That's what this feast was all about. Day one, day eight, set aside everything else. Question for you, and I was listening to this podcast again this morning. Do you Sabbath? Do you ever take a day and cease from all the stuff of life? I'm not talking about the day when you get to mow your